Up Close is presented by Tenova Healthcare with six hospitals and more than 1,000 dedicated physicians. For more information, tenova.com. This week on Up Close, our own Chef Garrett cooks up a few surprises. For him, food and art are on the menu. His story coming up. Thanks for joining us for Up Close. I'm Stephanie Aldrich. This week we have the pleasure of spending some time with one of our own, Chef Garrett Scanlon. You're used to seeing him travel all over Tennessee in our own television program, A Fork in the Road, seeking out the best food finds and dishing out recipes for you to try on your own. Each restaurant he visits has a story, and so does he. Listen to him for just a moment and you can hear that Chef Garrett was born in Ireland and those roots grew him into the chef he is today. First in his father's kitchen and family restaurant. Then at 19, when he was the youngest at the time to compete in the European Culinary Olympics, he got noticed. His training and career launched through five-star restaurants all over Europe, then the United States, an American dream come true. Now he's in Knoxville, supposedly to retire, but the kitchen is still calling, in a more casual way this time. We met at Garrett's downtown deli before he served us up his famous corned beef, and we learned that he also has a very creative side outside the restaurant business. Well, Chef, let's talk first about just where we are. A deli, a little sure. more on the casual side. You've worked very in much. some very fancy kitchens, and you are very, very accomplished. So yes. why a deli? Why now? Well, actually, I came to Knoxville essentially to retire. But I'm not the retiring type. So what Clearly. I wanted to do was, was open something that didn't require 100 hours uh, a week of constant labor, which I had been used to all my previous years. I wanted to do something a little more relaxed, a little easier to handle. And so that's what I did. So I, I do a, a little gourmet deli. We do really high end, very simple stuff, but very well prepared. The guys who really succeed in this business are guys who have tremendous work ethic. The talent, sometimes that comes. And, and it's important, but the single most important thing is to have that work ethic because it, it is an extremely demanding career. Sure, it's tireless, exhausting. Never ends. You have to love it. Every sure. meal, every meal must be as good as that one meal that the that the that the critic wrote about and said, "What a fabulous talent you were." Well, you've got to replicate that every single time out of the box. And if they come back next year, they want to see something new, something different. Um, my restaurant in uh, Michigan, which I sold to come here, actually, again, to retire. Uh, <laughs> You're uh, not retiring very well, <laughs> no, Chef. I'm, I'm very bad at <laughs> retirement. I am the worst retiree that ever lived. What are some of your favorite dishes that you prepare here? Well, what we do here is we have a, a standard menu, which is we're best known probably for our Reuben and our corned beef because we actually corn our own beef here. Um, nice. We bake hams, we do all that type of stuff. Everything we do here is, is made in-house. So really you make a sandwich, it. but you really make the we sandwich. We really make a sandwich, yes we do. We, as I say, we corn our own beef from scratch. You know, we bring the briskets in. It's a two-week process. But um, uh, we also do a lot of catering. But uh, what we do on uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we do an a in-house homemade hamburger here, which people rave about. And then we, we do features all the time. Tomorrow it's, it'll be a chicken fried steak uh, luncheon. It'll be, um, yesterday was a seven layer lasagna. It depends. Let's go way back a little bit about where you way were back. born. Sure, Wait, sure. Because I think people are always interested to know where, where people sure. came from. And yeah. uh, tell, tell me a little bit more about your childhood. I was uh, born in Dublin, Ireland. I uh, was brought up there. My father was in the restaurant business before me and a uh, small businessman, and like any small businessman, when you have five kids like he did, every one of those kids gets to work real quick. We all did. All the kids worked in the restaurant. All of them hated it except me. I loved it. I, I, I took to it immediately. Loved the restaurant business. So I was washing dishes and banging around his kitchen when I was a kid, 12, 13 years old. So five kids, one liked it. Pretty good odds. <laughs> Pretty good, yeah, yeah, I know. 20% isn't bad, you know. None of the others stayed in the restaurant business. As soon as they could get out, they ran. But uh, I took to it. Um, I, my, I went to my parents and told them, this is something that I want to do. I want to be a chef. Well, of course, in those days, being a chef was not exactly a glamorous uh, lifestyle choice. Uh, my mother cried for days. She told me I was going to be a galley slave. She couldn't believe it. How, how did but, they see it? 
that when you say it wasn't glamorous, they how? Oh, it was how a, it I mean, was we, a, we have well, this affinity for food today. I mean, there's all these food networks, and we follow that. the food and all. There sure. was none of that. Not at all. Sure, my mother said to me, "You're going to be. You're, I can't believe you're choosing to be a galley slave the rest of your life." I got two no cheese, one with pineapple. Okay. Yes. yes. That was their exact words to me. Because my father was in the restaurant business. And so he knew the, the type of demands that would be made upon him. And she knew how hard it was. Oh, absolutely. And there was none of the glamour that there is today. I mean, we didn't have celebrity chefs and all this type of thing. And, and chefs didn't make tremendous money in those. The very, very select few did. But it was something I, I just was very, very motivated to do. It was something that I really wanted to do. It, 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 it touched me somewhere that it was something I knew that I really wanted to do. So my father, in his great wisdom, decided that if that's really what I wanted to do, that he was going to send me to a top-level hotel, to a top-level chef, and I, it would either make or break me, one of the two. It would either cure me of it, or I would actually learn to be a chef. So your father, even though I'm sure he was doing, working very hard and providing very well with a family-owned restaurant, sure. he had visions of, okay, son, if you're going to do this, yes. I don't want you just being in the family business exactly. here. So he sent me off to a very good hotel, the Royal Hibernian Hotel, which was a four-star, wonderful hotel, all run, of course, by French chefs. And that's where I began my training. And I would go in in the morning, and I would set up the breakfast mise en place for the chefs, and then go to school. On the way home from school, you're in there in the evening working the dinner service. And you worked, and you worked, and you worked. And, it, and you really did develop uh, from the very onset. You knew right away that it was a very physically demanding a career that you were choosing because you worked all the time just like the other chefs and so I did that all through school um, as soon as I was able to then I, I went from there to the Grosvenor in London again another five-star world-ranked hotel with a great kitchen worked with a great chef did it keep you going I mean it just only made you, you that much more interested the work itself was what drove me because I can tell you they paid us buttons <laughs> we we made next to nothing and, and but it, it really was a different world than it is today um, First of all, the apprenticeship to be a chef. Um, you know, I'm at the tail end of that dinosaur time when you had to work, you worked a five-year apprenticeship. You couldn't go to college for, for two semesters and, and get a bit. It just didn't work that way. You actually had to go on and on and on and on. And you went through stages of the kitchen until you got to... Uh, where you were finally a chef de partie. You were and taken under then. someone's wing, and when Always. they said you were ready, that's, that's when correct. you were ready, not when a piece of paper necessarily said you were ready. That's exactly correct. And at that time, there were no such thing as really as culinary academies or anything. It really didn't, again, it didn't work that way. You went, you served your time under a master chef, and you learned and you learned. The biggest change that has happened in, in my lifetime in the kitchen is that all those years when I was training and working for those really, really fine, great chefs, no matter where you went, everybody cooked classical French cuisine, everywhere you went. So when you went from one kitchen to the next, even though you had this, this huge encyclopedia of knowledge because you moved from so many kitchens, the minute somebody said, we're doing a, a, a tornado baroness, you knew immediately, right, artichoke bottoms, bernet sauce, and you knew this right away. And, and no matter what kitchen you went to, everybody had the same format. You plated slightly different, might, but you always knew the classical correct way to, to do this stuff. Now, when I came to the United States, it was 1978, and I went to work at the Hilton in Chicago. And I will never forget it. I, they, had, uh, they had recruited me in Europe to come over. And when I got there, they had brought me in to be the chef of their flagship French restaurant mm -hmm. that they were just opening. Well, when I arrived, the restaurant wasn't ready to open. They'd had a setback. And the banquet chef had just quit. So I'm called up to the food and beverage director, calls me up to his office, and it was, it was the day, I had arrived the night before from Ireland, <laughs> and he brings me up to his office, a fellow by the name of Benny Green from Sligo, Ireland, would you believe, <laughs> he'd been there 37 years, he had a thicker accent than I could ever dream of having, <laughs> and he says to me, listen, the banquet chef is good, would you mind filling in, you know, downstairs in the banquets? I said, well, I don't care, I'm, I'm ready to go, let's go. Went in the next morning, and I had a lunch for 820 people, they were eating a thing called Swiss steak. Now, I had worked in Switzerland. I'd never heard of this thing in my life. <laughs> it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. They had these gigantic machines. Everything was, we wouldn't serve 880 dinners in a month in right. the restaurants. Very, I, I so a very in. different expectation, but they just totally said, different. chef, chef, yeah. fill hey, in the gaps. Listen, <laughs> you're wearing a white jacket, get in there and do it. Right. So you, I mean, talk about jumping off the deep end. It was like being on another planet. It was completely different from anything I had ever imagined. 
And I'll be honest with you, I didn't like it very much. And now I'm here I am in the US. My wife and kids are still back home in Ireland waiting for me to bring them over. I had come over expecting, you know, streets paved with gold and, and, <laughs> and people would be singing my praises about my fabulous cooking in my tiny little restaurant. And now I'm banging out these thousands and thousands of meals for, it, I just didn't like it at all. Up until that point, the, the entire restaurant and food business in the United States was really considered something of a joke around the world. I'll be very honest with you. In fact, one of the reasons I, it was easy for me to get to the United States was because all the top restaurants and hotels were recruiting Europeans. When I got here, there were no American chefs. All the chefs were Europeans. They were all guys who worked back home. Well, we eat too. It changed. <laughs> well, it changed drastically. What happened then was the 80s hit, and in the 80s, suddenly all these terrific American chefs started showing up. And, and I was right there. And fortunately, I was in Dallas when that happened. And I, I got out of the Hilton and I went to work at the mansion on Turtle Creek, which was a, a really a brilliant, brilliant uh, restaurant. Still is to this day, actually. One of the best restaurants in the country. And they were doing all this creative, cutting edge, southwestern, regional, and that's what they specialized in, and these fabulous American ingredients. And the chefs now, suddenly chefs are coming out of the, the CIA in New York, and these guys are talented, and, they're t and the whole food industry in the United States changed like that. What do you remember, though, as a boy, your father teaching you to make? What were some of the first dishes that you learned to make? Well, his restaurant was actually a really good steakhouse, and, and one of the first things I learned, which is, is ironic because we actually, don't even really teach it anymore to culinary students. Some of the first stuff I learned was how to butcher animals. I mean, how to take, we would bring in a side of beef and we would break it down. The chef uh, uh, showed me, here's, here's your bony knife, here's how you sharpen it, here's how you, and we were able to take these animals apart, lock, stock and barrel. Nowadays, if, if you want a, a sirloin of beef, that's what you order. Well, when I was a kid, we would bring in half a cow and you learned how to use it all. That was the other thing. You, you learned how to use the hoofs, the horns. We made aspic jelly out of that. The bones were for stock. Everything, every part of the animal was, was used. Every part of it. In fact, that's how really great cooking started. It was, it was knowing that you had this much animal. There's no point in using this much of it. Well, gosh, even just to cook in your own kitchen today, I mean, gosh, when I can buy uh, a chicken already cut up and parred for that's me, exactly then why right. am I then going to buy the whole to, chicken and right. why do it? But, well, there's, but exactly it's a skill right. that's lost. Of course, and that is, that's the issue. And, and again, everything, all of this comes in cycles. We're now seeing a return to a, of using a lot of products that, that maybe people's grandparents used to use. That is all coming back now, and a lot of chefs are really trying to get back to, to learning those basic skills that we learned as kids that have kind of been left out of the curriculum. The, the funny thing about most chefs, though, is that um, most chefs, no matter how creative and talented they are, very few chefs ever do well in the restaurant business. And, and the reason is because, for the most part, you never learn the business of how to run a restaurant. Now that, I thank my father for. What did he say? What was one of the lessons he gave you on, on his name? Let me answer that another way. The biggest mistake that chefs make is that we are, because we are always looking for the prize, we always want to be the best chef, we want to cook the best meal, a lot of times we get completely uh, myopic about how we see getting there and so the cost of ingredients and the amount of waste and the amount of staff and the amount of labor and the amount of energy and all those things that it takes to get to there you've got to be able to offset that by doing other things and making sure that you remain profitable most chefs go out of business it can be too big of a menu it can be too high of a price line for the for the neighborhood you live in mm -hmm. it can be it can be a lot of things but mostly what it is is self-indulgence <laughs> and we are all terribly guilty of that you've got to be able to moderate that with a good business sense and understand that you got to pay the bills what has Tennessee overall taught you about food and cooking well let me tell you Tennessee has come a long way that I can tell you Tennessee has some tremendous restaurants um, one of the things that's, there's a very, very active movement in Tennessee to use uh, local and sustainable um, produce. And but isn't that movement everywhere right now? It is now? everywhere, but in Tennessee it's extremely strong. Okay. And the farmer's market thing is really growing here and it's doing very, very well. The one thing about Tennessee is that we learned from doing the, the shows is that I had no idea that we had such a great wine 
producing industry here that we, we do we, we, we do Malaysian freshwater prawns here one of the biggest producers in the country right here in Tennessee we do a fork in the road with Chef Garrett so we do fried stuff now red prawns batter or just We're into our second season of that. We're shooting Which the we love, season. by the way. Thank you very much. I love doing it. I tell you, I, you know, it's amazing how many people watch that show. It's just absolutely amazing. I, everywhere I go, people watch that show. All over the state. Well, you just go on these adventures through meal by meal by meal and get yes. to meet a lot of well, people. Well, what we do, yeah, we pick three places. We do three segments. We pick three places. We talk to the people. We do we usually do a recipe. Yeah. We find out a little about them and, you know, how they got to where they are and what it is that they do. And, and um... The last segment of the show, we go back actually to my kitchen in my home, yeah. and I will rustle up something and show the audience at home how to do something that was inspired by that journey. So even with all of your esteemed training mm -hmm. and experience in yeah. five-star places, <laughs> yes. do your guests on that program ever teach you something new? Uh, yes, of course they do. I mean, I, look, you know, the, the one thing about this game is that it's always evolving, it's always changing, and you are always learning. Stop learning. It's all over. So yeah, sure, I learn stuff from, from our, our uh, people all the time, the people that we visit. Tennessee has a very diverse and very, very accomplished culinary scene here. I would like to see perhaps the day when we get a little more away from the, the chain restaurant and the fast food restaurant and, and a little bit more into that niche restaurant where people are doing, and that is starting to really develop. A lot of young chefs now working in Tennessee doing extremely well. You've worked in some big cities. There, is there something though to be said for a good, I don't know, a, a small town or even like a mid-sized city in Tennessee? And we have a lot of those in Tennessee. Yes, we do. Uh, is there something to be said though for having a good restaurant scene and just a good mid-sized city that maybe even a larger city can't offer? Well, I think so. I will give you an example of that. There is a town in Ireland, I go back to Ireland all the time, of course. There's a town in Ireland called um, uh, Kenmare. And in Kenmare, it's right on the seaside, it has six of the top 50 restaurants in the world. Six of them. The, the, there's as many restaurants as there are people living in this town. People come from all over the country, from all over Europe, from all over, to eat in these restaurants. The best restaurant, when I first came to Chicago, the best restaurant in Chicago wasn't in Chicago at all. It was in a tiny little town called Wheeling, Illinois, La Francais. Fabulous restaurant. People came from all over the country to eat in that restaurant. And you know, it, it, it's like that old movie, Build It and They Will Come. Mm -hmm. I'm a great believer in that. If the restaurant is good enough, absolutely. And I think that we could have a thriving, thriving restaurant scene in, in Tennessee. People will come to it. Is this just a trend because we're all trying to be more sustainable or do you really think that this is something that's going to stick? Or is it I, just I that we've always been that mindset but people are more likely to broadcast it now that, hey, this came from this farm down the street. What, what yes. are your thoughts about that uh, my, aspect? My, with my thoughts of it are, yes, it will, it will carry on. I don't think that's going to go away. I think it's actually going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. I think that a, a mistake a lot of, of places make is, is when you read the menu and there are three pages to tell you who picked the lettuce, what his middle name was, what color socks he was wearing when he did it. That, that's foolishness needs to stop because it gets pretentious and it gets silly. The bottom line is this, as we move as especially young chefs, and that's what it's all about because this is on their back now. I have done my thing. This is on their back. But I notice this trend as they move forward and, 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 and they grow their businesses. What they're doing is they're letting the customer know, here's where we get it. Here's where it's sourced. Here's who these people are. You can drive by their farm yourself. You can see how they raise these animals. As against that, you know, that faceless uh, truckload of stuff coming up. So, so, and I think people are very interested in that. I guess people also like to know that they're supporting maybe not just the restaurant and the, the efforts of the chef and the restaurant right there, but that there's someone else close benefiting well, absolutely. involved. Well, that is... That is a huge part of it. And remember this, we've had enough scares over the last few years of mm -hmm. uh, things about, you know, steroids in your food and antibiotics in your food and all this kind of growth hormone in your food, all this kind of stuff. At least locally sourced product, you know, you, you put people's mind to rest. Now, that there is a downside, and the downside, of course, is that those products tend to be more expensive than, than mass production. That's the price the guest has to pay.
because that's the price the chef has to pay. Sure. So that's just how that is. Well, I think most people assume that it's all food all the time with you, even it, with your hobbies and things, but there's something else you like to do to relax. I love to paint. I love to paint. That's, that's my other big passion. And I've done it, uh, well, as long as I can remember. I used to do it very poorly. I do it a little better now. I used to hang my paintings here in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. and do you one paint of the, food? No, I don't paint food. I paint people mostly. I paint forms. I, I you know, I, I paint all kinds of things. I, I suppose, you know, if you were to ask me what, what style of painting, I suppose it's uh, neo-impressionism, I guess is what they call it. It's sort of moody and a little bit dark and a little bit whimsical. It's just... It's just another side of me. It's another way I have of expressing myself when I'm not in the kitchen. I used to have my paintings hanging in here and someone came in and said, would you mind exhibiting them? We do an exhibition of paintings once a month. Would you mind if we showed yours? So I said, sure, I, why not? So we took them all down, we put them all up, we did an exhibition and I sold four paintings. I had, no idea, I had absolutely no idea that anybody would want to buy them, but they did. So then I, I was coaxed to go ahead and, and put it out there and see if anyone had any interest in, you know, carrying your paintings, showing your paintings. And so now it looks like I have a gallery in uh, Belfast, Ireland and Galway uh, that are interested in showing them. So there you go. And where do you paint? I, um, you know, up until this year, I only ever paint outdoors. But because we had so much terrible weather this year, I've started painting in my garage. Otherwise, I'd never get to paint at all. So I pulled the car out turn the lights on and I, I break out the oil paints and I paint right there in my garage. What does painting do for you? Mostly it gives me a level of calm and peace that I really don't get in any other aspect of my life. I start to paint and I just drift away. Uh, sometimes I'll be shocked when I see how long I've been doing it. I've been, and my legs will ache because I rarely sit down when I paint, I almost always stand. And I'm, the other thing that I find amazing about it is that when I finished, I'm utterly exhausted. And I had no idea I was so tired while I was doing it, but once I finished, I'm just drained. I, it's just one of those things. But I find it extremely satisfying and very frustrating because I don't think I've ever done a painting that I finished and said, that's exactly the way I wanted. I don't think that's ever happened. They're always a, a constant, but then that's the same with my cooking too, to be honest with you. It's, you're always correcting it, always trying to make it better. No matter what recipe you came up with, no matter how much the critics love it, you still, you're always looking to make it that, that tiny bit better. Do they kind of play off of each other a oh, little absolutely. bit? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They're Tell very me about much, that. Very much the same thing. Because as, as I alluded to, when I first started, I was very drawn toward doing a lot of um, what we call garde manger work, which is big, elaborate buffet pieces. And they're extremely artistic and they're very... Um, they're very detailed, and they take quite a level of skill to, to pull off. And I, that's what always attracted me, that finished thing where you go, oh, wow, look at that. And, and that, is, um, so that definitely plays right into the other side of it. I don't get to do that work anymore. In fact, even as my career progressed, less and less do you see that kind of work wherever you go. Nobody's really doing it anymore. It's sort of a lost art form. So I guess that's sort of made me swerve right into taking out a canvas and a brush and, and doing Well, it someone from the outside looking in might j just say, wow, Chef is just good at everything he sets out to do. Here's this guy, he's going to retire, and, you know, I'm just going to go paint in my garage and relax in retirement and run my deli in yes. daytime hours. Yes. Uh -huh. and, well, now I've got a, a showing and a mm -hmm. gallery. I know, and I'm not actually good at everything I do at all. In fact, my wife would be the first to tell you that I can't change a light bulb without help. You must have a favorite simple food. End of a long day, you're actually hungry. The last thing you want to do yes. is cook. What do you make? Uh, well, I, I, if I'm lucky, my wife will cook for me. Because uh, for me, the best meal in the world is something that's home cooked and a very, very simple. Roast stuffed chicken, my favorite dish in the world, if it's done correctly. And my wife, thank God, does that particular dish very well. But um, uh, my other favorite dish, which is very, people always look at it and think it's very finicky and it's very high end. But I, I love to make steak au poivre, peppered steak with a, a brandy cream sauce. Extremely easy to do. Um, 
people are always madly impressed by it, but it's actually one of the simplest dishes to do, one of my favorite dishes. I have to watch how much of it I eat now because <laughs> I don't hold the weight like I used to, you know. <laughs> I used to run around so much, I was always skinny, you know, I'm not so skinny, so. Oh, you look fit and trim. Uh-huh, sure I do. You got, well, you know, you have to, you have to you've got to taste <laughs> test it, right? Thank God for the skinny camera lens, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, but you've got a sample, you've got to know well, what you you're do, every there. chef, every chef, that's the other thing. I, if I see a chef working, he's not tasting his food, the chef's not going to work for me long. You got to taste as you go. You got to taste it. Someone's going to taste it. You got to taste it first. Very good. Thank you so much. You're full of surprises. I'm sure that's me. All cheers right. to yourself. All right. Cheers. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Good Thanks. seeing you. Thanks. You too. So weekends and evenings are for family and painting now, as you just saw. Today, you'll find Chef Garrett in his downtown deli weekdays for breakfast and lunch. But the master chef says he just may be itching to get another restaurant up and running. Kind of expected for a guy who spent 30 years in five-star kitchens, earning awards, and being featured in Food & Wine magazine and countless cookbooks. Check out his culinary adventures on our original program, A Fork in the Road with Chef Garrett, right here on East Tennessee PBS. I hope you'll join us here next week for another edition of Up Close. I'm Stephanie Aldrich. Up Close is presented by Tenova Healthcare with six hospitals and more than 1,000 dedicated physicians. For more information, tenova.com.